if you want to get if you want to get started, we can do a roll call and get started. Or if you want to wait for a moment or two to see if Maria or Aika join, we can do that as well. Hi, this is Aika. I'm here. Uh, Aika, can you put your camera on so we can see you? Yes, give me one second. Thank you. You like me to do roll call? I think it would make sense to get started. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, we have um, Laura Crandon I'm here. Present. Uh, ben. Let's see, Ben. Uh, Kathleen Brain, Mr. Brain. Here. And Dr. Allen. Here. Uh, Dana Weckesser. Here. All right. Um, uh, Maria, have you joined us? And singing is not going to be here. Okay. So we have five board members present, which is quorum. There's and actually Dana. six. Aika, you forgot Aika. Okay. Oh, Aika. One, two, three, four. I, sorry about that. Hello. You have your camera on. Now I see you. Thank you. All right, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Ben, you're on mute. And Maria has joined us as well. So uh, I'm printing the agenda. I think it's easier to- ben, 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 we can hear you now. Okay. So welcome everyone. I uh, appreciate all the board members and staff joining us today. We've gone through the uh, roll call. Uh, our next order of business is the uh, approving the minutes. Uh, the minutes you should have a copy of uh, and have had a chance to review. So I move to uh, approve the minutes from the January 16th meeting uh, as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. So uh, moving to the uh, public comment period, uh, did anyone register today, Cynthia, for comments? No, they did not. Okay. Um, very good. And we'll now turn to the executive director report. So much um, for uh, opening the meeting today and thank you board members for joining us today. Uh, we are in the midst of legislative uh, session as you are all well aware. And uh, there are several bills that uh, we have been monitoring at the exchange. Uh, two of them are actually MIA bills and we are supporting those. One is pediatric dental coverage requiring that all qualified health plans cover pediatric dental health benefits or benefits and currently all carriers do. 
uh, but this would just codify that for the future, any coming in would also be providing that. Uh, the other uh, MIA bill is a conformity bill, which updates Maryland's statute to conform to or clarify uh, changes to federal regulations in recent years, and we support that as well. And the third uh, MIA bill is premium payment threshold. And this is something, again, the carriers are doing now, but in varying degrees. And what this would do is, is work to have a threshold uh, for which someone could not be terminated for coverage if their outstanding payment was you know, a certain amount. And so that amount is being um, determined, the, the threshold amount in the bill, and I think there's some discussion around that, is $10 of the total net premium uh, owed on the health plan uh, before someone could be, I mean, they couldn't be terminated, but it was less than that. So we support that bill as well. And as I said, the carriers are doing this now, but in varying degrees. So this would just provide uniformity. The other two bills, which are uh, more directly related to the actual operations of the exchange, one is called the Access to Care Bill, and this would provide uh, the exchange with legislative authority to file the 1332 waiver to allow all Maryland residents, whether they have documentation uh, to, as a US citizen or not, to purchase through the exchange. It would not, of course, provide any federal subsidies to anyone who is not here in this country with proper documentation, uh, but would allow those, those folks who are in our state, who we know are accessing care, to purchase a health plan, to be able to compare all the health plans that we have through the marketplace, look to see if their doctor is there, if, they, um, if their prescriptions are there, utilize all the language services we have for the call center, then the robust consumer uh, support network that we have. So that um, is going forward and we'll, we'll see what happens on that. The other bill is really a technical uh, bill, which would allow us, we've spoken about this before, would allow us to take any unspent funds that were used uh, for the young adult subsidy program in prior years and move that forward to be spent so that we have the full $80 million, which was allocated over a four year period. And that seems to be moving um, forward well uh, also. So the other only other thing we have um, at the state level is we have our budget hearings March 1st and March 4th coming up, and we are ready and prepared to present on those. From a federal update, we are, of course, coming up against a couple other deadlines for continuation of funding for the federal government, March 1st and March 8th. Uh, so we, we'll see what happens with those two dates, but again, we've been assured that all of our operations would continue and not be affected if the government does shut down. There is a lot of talk already, and we've spoken here before about it, uh, around the continuation of the ARPA expanded tax credits and how um, important that is for the enrollments that we've had and the affordability of coverage. So that is getting a lot of attention from all circles already, and we um, anticipate that will continue to be the case. Regarding um, more closer to home within the agency and, and staffing updates, um, we received, the exchange received another award for our media campaign for last year, not this year, last year's one where we had, it was called The Unexpected, where we had the, uh, the guys watching the um, soccer match and one jumps up and falls over behind the sofa. And it's won several awards, but this award is really, really remarkable because it is called um, the, an the Annual Anthem Award, and it is an international award. So there were, uh, let's see, over 2,000 submissions from 44 countries around the world, 10,000 plus reviews from jurors, and over 25 supporters uh, in the community vote voice that voted on this, um, on our ad, our marketing campaign, and we actually won a gold award. So that's really exciting and, and really um, says a lot for the work we put into that and really making sure that in this case, and this was a category of um, 
health public service product innovation service categories for federal, state, and local governments. So really excited about that. And that was a fun commercial. The other good uh, news, this year in January is the first year ever in the existence of the exchange that we actually saw our enrollments in January increase. Typically what happens after open enrollment, they start to trend down. But again, this is a testament to the, the movement of people from the public health emergency unwinding and keeping them moving over. And speaking of the Medicaid um, redeterminations and renewals, as you'll recall, we, we changed the process by which we do the redeterminations at the individual level from a household level. And that really helped us increase what we refer to as an auto renewal or an auto redetermination. The month that this month we just ran, we had 68% of our 100,000, about 100,000 Medicaid enrollees were auto renewed into coverage. So that's terrific. That means, you know, they don't have to do a thing. They're just going to continue in that coverage, which is really, really good. It should put a lot of relief on our call center and our consumer assistance workers. And most important, make sure there's, there's continuity of care for these consumers. So I will stop there and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, first off, I wanna note that board member Rodriguez has joined us. Uh, welcome. And uh, I had a couple questions on the uh, budget hearing. Have you, has the staff, received any comments from the DLS analyst regarding uh, the board's 2025 budget or any uh, issues? No, in fact, we just reached out today. Tony reached out to our analysts today to say, we know it's, you know, it's coming up. We're not pressuring you, but do we have everything? And they have to get it out to us. Um, I think it's within three days before the hearing. So we have not received anything yet. Uh, thank you. Do other board members have questions? Hearing, hearing none. Uh, let's move to the next agenda item, which is uh, my report for uh, the Finance Committee, which met on January 29th. Uh, Singh was present and chaired the meeting. Uh, of course, he's not available today. We had three agenda items. Uh, the first was a rather lengthy uh, review of the uh, exchanges finance finances by CFO uh, uh, Tony Arminger. Uh, that was very helpful, I think, for all three of us that were present. Uh, secondly, uh, Scott Brennan, who's the Director of Compliance and Privacy, uh, focused his uh, presentation primarily on the legislative audit that is ongoing. Uh, he uh, noted potential areas uh, where there could be uh, OLA concern uh, and, and did note that uh, the expectation would be that the audit would be completed uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, those of us who have gone through an L OLA audit uh, know it's uh, painful, but oftentimes very helpful uh, and it, it, there didn't seem to be uh, from uh, Mr. Brennan's perspective, uh, enormous areas of concern. And then uh, lastly, uh, Ms. Atta uh, did review with us a, uh, a privacy incident and reviewed uh, the, po the privacy uh, policies that MHPE uh, employs. I think that was very helpful. It, did not seem as though uh, the issue was one of ongoing concern uh, and uh, the policies had been uh, employed correctly uh, in this particular case. Uh, there were no remaining outstanding issues uh, and, the, uh, and the committee adjourned uh, at approximately, I think it was about uh, an hour and a half after it began. The, uh, I, I know Laura is also was also present. Uh, do you have any other comments uh, you'd like to make, uh, Board Member Crandon? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll next move to the uh, standing. Or excuse me, lo the long-awaited strategic plan from from uh, Mr. Ratner is next. I know we deferred that in the January meeting. 
And uh, I want to turn the floor over to Andy. Uh, begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, hopefully I can live up to that. Um, uh, so one way to look at the strategic plan uh, for us, I think, is to think of it as sort of your home maintenance plan, sort of like your roof, your windows, your drainage, you know, can it stand up to a storm? And it seems like, and the specific plan doesn't really address the, specifically the storms, which happen to blow through almost every year for us, you know, it could be a pandemic, it could be unwinding from the pandemic, it could be policies blowing from one direction in the federal government, blowing from the other direction, uh, it could be technologies that, you know, when the exchange started, not too many people had smartphones and now it's uh, so heavily mobile uh, and, you know, in the coming years, AI will be emerging. Um, but the plan doesn't specify sort of what we're doing for each of those things. It's more like if you can make the organization strong, can you handle whatever storm is going to come? Um, so that's one way to think about it. So um, that we're about a little more than midway through this three-year strategic plan, um, which sort of has, was structured on three, three pillars of organizational strength, product growth, and telling our story. And under organizational strength, we wanted a comprehensive approach to risk. We wanted to develop our employees. We wanted to secure the agency's financial position, strengthen the organization through data, and build board leadership and governance practices. In product growth, we want to expand to serve the small group market, ensure availability and accessibility of products, and maintain affordable product affordability. And in telling our story, we wanted to expand our outreach, build and leverage partnerships, and support storytelling with data. Next slide, please. And this is the timeline that we sort of worked under. So we we had numerous meetings in the fall of 2021 where we were planned through and sort of drafted the plan. And then there was a board retreat a little more than two years ago uh, where we finalized the strategic plan. Uh, we launched that first year in uh, June 2022, the beginning of the fiscal 23 state budget year um, with about 32 work items. Uh, the next June, this past June, was the second year uh, with about 29 work items. And uh, today we're presenting sort of a progress report to the board and we'll launch the third year of this plan, the third and final year of this plan in June. Uh, it has about 15 work items. Next slide. So I'll walk through some of the items. I didn't list them all. I think in your packets you have sort of the full, uh, the, the full multiplicity of of the various work items that we have in this plan. But under organizational strength highlights, and this is for the second year of the plan, we wanted to, um, we've completed, or some of these are ongoing, evaluate procurement process to minimize risk. So some of the things we do, we've set up a, a work group. Uh, we are more methodical about our approach to a minority business enterprise, uh, a priority of the administration. Um, we, you know, we met goals previously, but I don't know if we were as methodical about it as we wanted to be. So we have put more structure into that. Uh, we've also made some changes in the process of the IDIQ procurements um, to address certain things that were uh, pointed out in correction of ac action plans. So some changes to that as well. Uh, applying to extend the reinsurance waiver, you know that happened. We won approval for that last summer, and now that will be extended through uh, the end of calendar 2028. And updating memoranda of understandings, MOUs, and data use agreements as needed to procure data, and um, the entire leadership team, uh, and particularly the compliance department, have you know have been um, trying to make sure that that is done in a, in a structured fashion, and trying to partner with sister agencies to share data. Uh, we'll have another a new data analyst coming on board the policy team soon, and uh, uh, we hope to do more than we have done in the past in terms of being able to partner with sister agencies to um, share data. Three things that at the top of the list to be completed under that pillar would be creating a roadmap for management team and staff succession, established in Google Drive and shared drive policy and protocols, and cataloging and publish, publishing all our non-exchange entity agreements 
um, in uh, the, the various contracts that we have. The second pillar of product growth uh, completed or ongoing are updating the value plans based on affordability work group outcomes. I think you know about some of this. We've standardized uh, those value plans this past year um, to try to streamline them. Uh, they're more in line with the way the federal marketplace operates uh, to uh, try to make those uh, more, more compelling, more consumers. Um, those value plans have um, more, um, uh, more services prior to deductible. And we also tried to focus on uh, illnesses such as diabetes to so that people wouldn't um, you know have affordability issues um, in in those cases. Uh, establish a preferred producer program to provide optimal producer engagement. If you were to go in, to enroll today on MarylandHealthConnection.gov and go to find help and go to a broker, you'd see a little sort of button on the brokers that were the top top brokers in terms of production last um last year so you know sort of trying to give a little bit of guidance to consumers like you know here's a list of hundreds of names but you know here, here's a hundred or so that performed well in the last year um evaluate and secure data analysis resources we talked about that a little bit and evaluate additional affordability programs uh, you know about the expansion of the young adult subsidy this past year with the help of the mia uh, you know, the age was increased from 30, top age from 34 to 37, and the um, response to the program was stronger than it's ever been. To be completed in this bucket are identify, engage, support, and align with appropriate partners, including health equity, equity networks to reduce health inequity, um, and evaluate broker compensation. And finally, under Telling our story highlights completed or ongoing in this bucket for this, this second year is partnering with other groups on events such as the Forum of the Health of Black Men, co-sponsored with the Afro last year. Um, we want to continue to look for um, community voices that can help us spread the word about the importance of health insurance uh, and the affordability of it through the exchange. Uh, secondly, identify and develop health insurance literacy partnerships and materials uh, because complexity is, you know, one of the main impediments for people signing up and evaluate and secure tools for data reporting. Uh, as you know, we have the dashboard uh, and I don't know if you've gotten a look at it in a while, but the reports, the data, monthly data reports on our website uh, we've really overhauled them in the last year or so based on suggestions that came from the Standing Advisory Committee uh, and other people. Uh, ben was helpful in that, other people that we talked to, and I think we've included more information than we had before in those reports. Um, to be completed and telling our story is developing a marketing strategy and plan for the small business market. Some of this will align with um, our timetable for uh, improving the the usability of the website for small business coverage. And secondly, when developing data to support our mission and refreshing internal and external reporting, identify whether new data is needed from sister agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, we're continuing to work with MD Think um, on, you know, on our, our MOU and, uh, you know, going forward uh, in uh, how, how that will be approached. And are there any questions from the board? Ben, are you talking? I couldn't. You might be on mute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ratner. Uh, I have one question before uh, I ask for others is there is a rather oblique uh, reference there on broker compensation. Could you elaborate on that? Is there a concern? Uh, I would I would guess that there might be, but please clarify. I don't know if uh, if Michelle or Johanna want to get any more of the details on on that topic. No, the, I I can weigh in on that. It's something that we've heard for years from the individual insurance uh, producers brokers that um, there, and you might recall way back when there was concern that once they came on the exchange, the carriers wouldn't compensate them. 
And that has, you know, we've stayed that off, but it is a discussion that comes up all the time on producers being compensated. And of course, we know the value that they bring to our consumers that we, we really rely on them as the experts. So we put it there as a discussion point um, to just kind of keep our finger on the pulse of you know what's happening with the with brokers getting compensated and really to continue to advocate for the need for them to get be compensated in the fashion that they are today um, because they do so much for our consumers. Thank you, Michelle. Other questions? So um, a, a kind of a general question. And we suffer uh, at MHCC from this, or benefit, uh, depending on how you look at it. It doesn't seem like there's many measurable outcomes uh, to judge success. Um, maybe you know a more detailed document highlights that. But uh, Andy, do you want to comment on that? Sure, sure. Yeah, some of it I think is obviously you know very measurable by data, and I think the fact that. You know, we and partly I think what uh, one of the saving uh, one of the greatest things about this agency is the uh, the mission is so crystal clear. So this past open enrollment was the fourth record enrollment in a row. Uh, the increases in coverage in virtually all demographic groups and all geographies was up sometimes mostly by double digit percentages. So I think in terms of reaching you know, the, the counties that have the higher incidence of lack of health coverage, those were up double digits uh, in terms of reaching Black and Hispanic populations that were historically underinsured, that was up double digits. And among young adults in Black and Hispanic communities, that was up 40 or 50 percent. So, you know, from the things that we can measure from data, um, the, um, the shift in the in the Medicare population and the unwinding, we have enrolled about 37,000 people who were in Medicaid and are now in private insurance since June when the unwinding began through the middle of January. So I think, and, and as Michelle said, it's the first time in the history of the exchange that the enrollment was higher at the end of July, uh, at the end of January than it was in the middle of January. Uh, when open enrollment ended. So by plenty of measures. And then I think there are other things that maybe can't quite be quantified in data, but you know, we talked, you talked about, you asked about the brokers. And I think Johanna and Mimi and Teresa in marketing have done an incredible job of improving our our communications and our relationship with our broker community, which I know as as Commissioner Barain would know, you know, when the Affordable Care Act got started, it took years till the broker community was warmed up to what this was about. And increasingly, I think they have seen both the uh, the benefit to it financially and also in terms of building their own customer bases. You know, some of it is is it through numbers and some of it is just in uh, in the relationships that we have. But, uh, you know, we'll try to keep that in mind as we uh, report out going forward on the strategic plan. Oh, well, thank you. And Andy, if I may, Mr. Seffen, you know, other things that we track, but we don't report all the time. And I'll, I'll talk speaks specifically about staffing. So we spend a lot of time, you know, we do surveys with our staff. We look at what training opportunities we have for our staff. We as a state agency have a, have a, and have continued to have a very low turnover rate. We have less than a 4% vacancy rate on an annual basis. And that's been noticed by DBM. Um, so there's things such as that that are in our strategic plan um, that we're, you know, we're not reporting all the time, but we have that data and we have the, that uh, information. And, I, and I, I guess I would add the one, the, the most frustrating data point that hasn't really moved that much, honestly, obviously, is the uninsured rate. Um, but that's not all due to the exchange. There are other factors, employer sponsored coverage, Medicare enrollments, all kinds of things. But um, I mean, I think that's why we're looking very closely at things like the access to care bill and and other types of legislation. Um, because I think that's been probably the most sort of uh, the, the number that we would like to see move and, and we haven't really been able to see that move. So that's that's on that column. Thank you. Other questions? 
Hearing none, I would note that uh, Chair Dr. Laura Herrera Scott has arrived. So Dr. Scott, we are on this, we've just concluded the strategic plan and we're at the Standing Advisory uh, Committee member appointment uh, agenda item. If I Thank you, Ben. That on, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Sorry I was late. Um, um, happy February, everyone. Um, with that, um, we'll hear from the uh, Standing Advisory Committee. So is that, yep, there you go. Hi, thank you. Um, I will breeze through this presentation and sort of open it up for questions. Um, so the uh, Maryland Health Benefit Exchange posted the application for recruitment um, December 5th, 2023, with the deadline of January 25th, 2025. Uh, the application and member recruitment process was consistent with MHBE's policy and procedure. And with Maryland statute, um, it directs MHBE to ensure that um, the representation of the membership consists with and is reflective of gender, racial, ethnic, and geographic diversity of the state, as well as represents a diverse cross section of stakeholders. And so for the recruitment, the application was placed on the website, shared with current members, as well as um, recruit, um, outreach particularly to targeted areas. And so those targeted areas um, were particularly looking at a representative of the Western Maryland region, as well as a connector entity slash navigator representative. Um, and looking to the far right of your screen, you can see on the table here, the membership currently has 16 people, a part of um, the standing advisory committee. And the, we have about uh, nine applications listed, and there is one um, Western representative that's on the that was a part of that application cycle, which was directly connected to the recruitment for that region. Next slide, please. And so nine individuals applied to the Standard Advisory Committee for 2024. The applicants included a healthcare provider, advocate, broker, navigator, as, as well as insurers, including new representatives from Aetna and Delta Dental and applications. So as you saw on the last slide, there were um, current, there's currently 16 members. Um, we received nine applications just for a bit of historical context. There were 10 members whose term ended in 2023. And so typically, historically, uh, we've kept this committee um, around 20 individuals. And so by having the 16 plus the nine, that will bring the current membership to 25 if all applicants are approved. And so wanting to just give a little bit of some of that situational context there. And so um, myself, along with the chair, recommend that the board appoints all nine applications and we'll go in a bit to um, who those nine folks are coming up in the next slide. And so we'll be working to uh, recruit an additional member um, that's representative of the Capital North or South reasons. On the last slide, um, you may have noticed there were a couple of blanks across the geographical context. Um, and so the members are, uh, the nine applications that we received are skewed towards insurer representat representation across the board. And so the SAC terms for the representatives for all three 2020 th carriers ended in 2023. Um, Aetna joined along with um, two dental carriers. And so um, that weren't previously participating. And so the increase in number that you're seeing is also attributed to that as well. Next slide, please. And so these are the nine um, individuals who are applicants. And so an overview, five of them represent health plan insurers, one represent the advocacy field, one represent, um, is a navigator representative, one is a broker, and the other one is a healthcare provider. Uh, there are a few candidates um, that are applying for a second term, and that's Stephanie listed on the screen here, and Allison, um, and MHBE staff checked with the legal department and confirmed that while uh, term appointments are limited to no more than three years, there's nothing that prohibits an individual from applying for and serving more than one term. 
And so next slide. And I will sort of open it up to any discussions prior to this. This is Dana. I have a, a comment, even though um, I think the number was what, four or five carriers having representation. But, One mm -hmm. of the um, other applicants used to work for a carrier. So it's even heavier at health insurers than it at first appeared. And that's somewhat troublesome, but at the same time, it's great. We have other carriers in the Merlin Health Connection. So I want to point that out. And um, obviously, um, SAC leadership and, and um, the board liaison and staff noticed that we need more diversity and representation from what Montgomery and uh, you know Northern Capital Region. And if I recall in the um, memo or something, and more black representation. So I think that's great. I am a little uncomfortable with the heavy, heavy, heavy carrier stuff. But at the same time, I know they all need a voice. And I'm just going to ask that um, we all be aware of this. And and I'm going to ask the board liaison and, and staff to make sure that any meetings that the insurers don't take over and, and not let other voices be heard. That's a real concern for me. Thank you for that comment. And yeah, that was, we had a bit of smooth dialogue kind of around that and sort of it's a, it's a pro and a con kind of in the same sentence. <laughs> and so um, I think that's kind of connected to specifically wanting to, um, so in April of this year, uh, we'll be looking to recruit an additional member to sort of help expand some of that representation. And so in April, uh, I'll bring to the board again, um, once that time comes. Ben has his hand raised for question. Uh, yes, uh, I was curious about uh, a seed co's representation as a uh, as a contractor to MHBE within the uh, bylaws and and policies of MHBE. Uh, I don't recall we've had navigators before, but maybe my recollection fails me. It, it does seem a bit odd to have a, someone who's a contractor to the commission be uh, on the uh, advisory committee, but I'm sure uh, staff or Aika has a good answer. I can speak to a little bit of it and then maybe I can turn it over to Johanna on the call as some of the recruitment kind of overlapped with me, my starting time. So I missed sort of the onset of this. So there may be some additional context to provide, uh, but particularly from a background perspective, that candidate you're talking about, I believe is Mark. Um, Mark has uh, just a wide span of um, experience across public outreach and education. And um, some of his work has expanded across 10 counties. And so there was a lot of just thoughts around how there could be additional context that could be helpful across varying geographies outside of the one region that um, he's currently in, um, as well as just um, training and leading teams experience and other professionals, navigators across the board. And so thinking that, you know, a lot of his work can bring some of that grassroots and local perspective um, to the space. But I want to turn it over to Joanna for anything else, additional context that may be helpful. Add that we have um, traditionally had navigators on the SEC, so this isn't out of uh out of our normal process. Um, I think you know, similar to carriers, carriers aren't our grantees, but they are individuals that we have relationships with or brokers. They're another um kind of key voice that we like to keep included and they often provide really helpful um, information about consumer perspectives on the policies we're thinking about. Also, Johanna, if I recall, there was a gentleman on the stack who was from Western Maryland and I think he was one of those navigators, wasn't he? I don't remember his name right off my head. The top of my head. yes, we had a uh, David Stewart from Western Maryland who's yes. here, and um, we've had each cam representatives and other other folks on um, our navigator um, yeah. affiliated. Mm -hmm. 
directors on the SEC in the past. And he was a great advocate for the people in Western Maryland, not so much for his office or for himself. He was right there for the people. So I really appreciated his input. Are there any other questions from anyone? And and Dana, I want to be clear before I make a motion that you weren't suggesting any changes, but just on a go forward basis. Well, I I came to the meeting intending to make a suggestion, but I realized that maybe I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So hearing that. I'm going to make the motion to move to approve the appointment of the applicants to the 2024 Standing Advisory Committee as presented. Um, can I get a, 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 a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we, Scott, can we can we take a roll call vote because we need affirmative of five and it's it's hard to get that without a roll call. So um, I'm a yes. And I'm happy to go through the names. OK, yeah. How about if you go okay. through the names? Um, Dr. Allen? Yes. Uh, Board member Luke? Yes. Mr. Brain? Yes. Board member Crandon? Yes. Board member Pilar Rodriguez. Yes. And we already got Secretary Herrera Scott. Board member Stefan. Yes. And board member Wekeser. Yes. Oops. Yes. Thank yes. you. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Johanna to talk about the 2025 final plan certification standards. Thank you, and we can go on to the next slide. So just a reminder of timeline here, um, back in September, we shared with the board that our only intended new plan certification standard for 2025 was um, to update our value plan standards as needed to comply with federal law. And that and specifically the federal actuarial value calculator, which um, dictates plant generosity and uh, affects the cost sharing that we can offer for each of our plans. So that draft calculator, that federal tool was released just before Thanksgiving. Um, and then we worked with our actuarial consultants in the Maryland Insurance Administration to review the impact to the 2024 plans, identify changes um, that we thought could be made to uh, bring those 2024 plans into compliance with the new 2025 requirements, and then publish those for public comment um, from December 22nd through January 27th. So we received comment on those um, incorporated feedback we got and are coming back to the board now to present the final, um, see a typo there, sorry, in my last bullet point, the final 2025 value plan standards to the board. And these reflect minor updates to com comply with the federal AB calculator, as well as a clarification to our diabetes cost sharing requirements per a request that we got from a carrier last year. So on the next slide, um, we have uh, just some background on our value plans for um, board members that may be newer. So as a reminder, um, each carrier is required to offer a value plan at the bronze, silver, and gold medal level. Carriers can offer a total of four plans per medal level this year. That goes down to three plans per medal level in 2025. So one of those plans has to be a value plan, and then they can offer um, additional plans up to the limit per metal level of their own design. The goal with um, creating the value plans, um, which were launched back in um, 2020 and then modified for 2024, is to improve healthcare access and affordability. Um, that's really by promoting a plan design that reduce, that tries to make out-of-pocket costs for consumers manageable for frequently used services um, and understandable to consumers. So we prioritize co-pays over co-insurance so that costs are predictable. 
another of our goals um, is to promote health equity through plan design. The value plans also help to promote insurer competition because cost sharing for commonly used services is standardized across each value plan, regardless of which carrier is offering it. So that means when consumers are comparing these plans, at least they can focus just on things like the quality rating of the carrier, um, the network, who's in network with the carrier, and then the premium. So they're not trying to figure out, well, I have a $1,000 deductible here and a $1,500 deductible deductible there, but this benefit is covered pre-deductible here and not there. That's all simplified and standardized for them. Um, so next slide. Um, and then actually before I touch on this, I'll also just um, mention to the board that the 2024 plan design, so that's when we launched this kind of comprehensive um, consistent cost sharing for the plans were uh, generated through extensive stakeholder input in our 2022 affordability work group, which had um, consumer, uh, advocate, carrier, broker, um, navigator representatives. So we had all of our stakeholders at the table to help us come up with these cost sharing amounts for 2024. And then those plans launched for this year on that kind of updated version of value plans. So the last thing I wanted to touch on here as background is um, just a refresh of what actuarial value is. So as you know, our plans are divided into different tiers that we kind of grade based on metal levels from bronze up to platinum with bronze requiring having typically the lowest premium, but requiring the consumer to pay the most out of pocket when they go to the doctor up to platinum, which will have a higher premium, but require lower costs when you're using services. So in order to do that categorization by metal level, um, that is done by looking at the generosity of um, the plans, which is called the actuarial value. And so that federal, the federal government sets parameters of the actuarial value at each metal tier. So for example, a silver plan would on average cover 70% of a consumer's out-of-pocket costs when they're using services. The consumer would be responsible for 30% of costs kind of across a whole population of folks enrolled in that metal level. Um, so how you determine whether the plan is covering 70% of costs and qualifies to be a silver plan is through use of this federal tool called the actuarial value calculator. The tool is updated each year and because the plan has to fit within, you know, this band of actuarial value at each metal level, you often have to make trade-offs. So if you want to reduce a deductible, you might have to increase cost sharing somewhere else. Or if you want to reduce cost sharing on one service, you may have to increase it on another. So all that to say that our hands are somewhat tied by the federal AV requirements. Um, next slide. So when we put these out for a comment, we got the comments described here. Um, not a whole lot of comments. We were trying not to make major changes because these this set of um, cost sharing designs just launched for 2024. So they've only just been implemented. So we want a little time and experience with the market kind of getting used to what these plans are before we make significant changes going ahead. So we're trying to mostly maintain the status quo for 2025, apart from what we had to do to comply with the AV calculator. Um, we got a comment from Care First saying that the designs that we initially put out in January, we needed to further reduce the AVs on those a bit because we also require carriers to cover routine services for individuals with diabetes at $0 cost sharing, which has its own AV impact. And so Care First, through their calculations, said that the AV impact for that diabetes benefit was larger than we had thought it might be, and therefore we needed to slightly reduce the AV on certain plans. So we've accommodated that in what we're presenting to the board today. We also got a request from Kaiser to tweak um, cost sharing for pediatric dental. That was kind of outside the scope of what we were trying to do for 2025, but we are planning to convene a work group later this year to talk about changes for 2026, and we'll include it on the agenda then. 
And then also just that typo that Kaiser caught that we corrected. Next slide. So to get into the um, nitty gritty of what the changes are from 2024 to 2025 um, by metal level um, on the bronze plan, we've reduced the out-of-pocket max um, slightly by about $250. And the out-of-pocket max is the most that a consumer can pay out-of-pocket in cost-sharing in a year. After the consumer hits their out-of-pocket maximum, the um, carrier will cover 100% of costs for covered benefits received from an in-network provider from that point onward. The federal government sets the out-of-pocket maximum amounts each year. Usually they increase slightly. It so happens that for 2025, they've decreased slightly. That's why you see this number going down from 2024 to 2025. And as that sort of like trade-offs that I mentioned, because that went down, we ended up having to increase cost sharing elsewhere to compensate. So we're proposed to increase the specialist copay from 90 to $100. Same, um, now I'm gonna get into the silver plans. And just as a reminder here, for silver plans, we have what we call the base silver, which is the plan that offers that roughly 70% actuarial value. If you're below 250% of the federal poverty level, you qualify for a silver, what we call a silver variant or a cost sharing reduction or CSR variant plan. That means that the plan increases the generosity um, for these lower income folks and it has an actuarial value that's above the base 70% for silver. So there's three silver variant plans um, that are kind of federally required that each carrier offers for these lower income enrollees. So for the silver 73 variant, meaning it has an actuarial value of 73%, which is very minimally different from the base silver. Um, again, we had to reduce the maximum out of pocket based on federal changes. And again, we increased the specialist copay from 90 to 100. Uh, next slide. On the silver plan that offers an 84% actuarial value, which is available to people between 150 and 200% of the federal poverty level, we actually, um, here we were able to slightly increase the out-of-pocket maximum, um, which helped offset um, the AV calculator changes that uh, had increased the AV here and, and forced these offsets. We also, again, slightly increased the specialist copay by $5 and the generic drug copay by a dollar. And then for the silver 97 variant, which offers um, kind of platinum level coverage to individuals between 138 and 150% of the federal poverty level, so folks who are just over the Medicaid threshold, we again increased the medical out-of-pocket maximum by $100 increased the specialist copay by $5 from $15 to $20, and then increased um, a set of outpatient services, primary care, mental health substance use disorder office visits, and speech, physical, and occupational therapy copays from $2 to $5. Um, and so we didn't want to make all of those changes, but we were really forced to find ways to reduce the actuarial value in order to remain in compliance with the, the federal calculator. And then lastly, on the gold plan, we increased again the specialist copay from 30 to 35. So you can see in general, we focused on slightly in, slight increases to the specialist copay and then where necessary made small tweaks to other services. Um, next slide. So I won't go um, into the details here, but I wanted to provide them for reference. This is the comprehensive list of cost sharing categories, deductibles, out-of-pocket maximums. Um, the, the acronym MOOP there stands for maximum out-of-pocket. And then below those, um, each service and the associated cost sharing by point and type. The um, colors, the font in blue indicates that the uh, benefit is covered pre-deductible. So you can see that even though the deductibles on the medical side might seem on the high end in some cases, most of many of these services are covered um, 
without regard to your deductible. So you just pay the copay. You don't have to have met your deductible for the services in blue font. Next slide. Um, here is kind of an additional list of services, um, including uh, drug coverage. And then next slide, we've got um, some additional service categories. These don't directly impact the actuarial value because they're not included in the EV calculator, but they're still um, commonly used services that we sought to standardize. And last slide. Last, we have a couple of the two um, benefits that are available for children, specifically vision and dental and the cost sharing for those. And then final slide, uh, just the final few kind of notes on the plan designs in, in um, some additional details. So I mentioned that enrollees with a diagnosis of diabetes pay $0 cost sharing for um, routine services, which are listed out on this slide. This was a recommendation of our affordability work group with a particular focus at both aligning the state population health goals and um, addressing health equity, given that diabetes particularly impacts um, Marylanders of color. So we're not proposing changes to this per se, but rather just a clarification, which is in the blue text. Um, we had previously stated for 2024 that carriers were required to cover a list of diabetes supplies and medications um, defined by the insurer. And we received some feedback from carriers that it would be helpful to provide some more specific guidance around this. So we looked at what carriers were currently offering um, and what was kind of common across them. And uh, also, you know, what we would expect and came up with this guidance, which is that all carriers must cover at zero dollars test strips and glucometers, preferred brands of insulin, and at least one from three classes of oral hypoglycemics. All carriers do currently meet this requirement, so um, there should be no change. It's just a clarification. Um, and with that, I think I... I will stop and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question. I'm not sure, Johanna, you would know the answer. Perhaps uh, Dr. Herrera Scott would. If you could go back uh, uh, one slide, you, you list um, the oral hypoglycemics and you list three categories. Is there another category that's in, that's up and coming, that's being researched so that? Not that we have to include it, but maybe include language that says, and any other future FDA approved categories or something like that. Well, there are several other categories. They're very, very expensive categories. So mm -hmm. like the drugs that are here are dollars per month. When you bring in the other categories like GLP-1 and DPP, then you're getting into the five to $800 per month category. Okay. And is it rare that people really, really, really need those? In other words, those people would be covered by these other categories. So, you know, metformin is usually the, the drug of choice. That's what you start on. Mm -hmm. um, so people might need those other drugs. Um, it's just what I think, you know, this is saying is, is that there would be a copay for those drugs. So it wouldn't preclude you from getting those drugs. It's just that That's it wouldn't right. be zero dollars per month. Okay, that makes me feel better. Thank you. But I have several questions, Joanna, because I don't remember this last year and probably because I was too new. Um, and I just want to make sure, you know, I understand. So when you said healthcare costs manageable, like how do we how do we define that? Is it this actuarial va value calculator that does that? Like how do we how do we define what's manageable? Is it a percentage of FPL, you know, what you make given the range that you said? I just want to understand that piece. Sure. So the federal government really defines through the actuarial value what portion of costs the plan is going to cover. Our goal is to try to identify services that are commonly used and particularly okay. those most prioritized like primary care generic okay. drugs and make sure that those are have low copays. Okay. And then my next question is, 
you know, the bronze plans always make me nervous, right? Because the out-of-pocket is so expensive. So what happens is those people don't get the services they need because the out-of-pocket's too expensive. And then they just wait till they're really sick and then crash into the ED. So do we know anything about healthcare utilization in the bronze? That's one. And then two, let's say I come into the exchange and I have um, diabetes, hypertension that are moderately managed so that maybe going into a silver plan or even the gold plan by virtue of the fact of, you know, what's zero copay to meet, manage my needs. Do we also guide them to say, hey, this might feel more expensive, but over time, this plan will be less expensive? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the second question. We have, uh, as you're going through the enrollment process or doing comparison shopping on our website, we ask you to enter, it's voluntary, but I think most people do it, your estimated healthcare utilization, and you just do a low, medium, high, and it gives you a guidance of this means, you know, so many doctor's visits per year, you're using so many drugs, and then you self-categorize. Okay. And then we use that to create a total annual cost estimate, which we rank plans by. So we'll look at your utilization and premium and then get, you know, estimate what your total cost will be, which will often boost um, silver or gold plans up in our rankings for them. And then, then last question, anything you can say about demographics, particularly around race and ethnicity and who's in the particular plans? Like, do people self-select because um, they really can't afford it? So the coverage, especially for brand, bronze, is more for a catastrophic event versus ongoing maintenance. That's one. And then two, I certainly worry about primary care and behavioral health and 10 to $35 is a big jump, especially um, for behavioral health. If there's, you're in a treatment plan, that's a big Delta. Um, was there any consideration for increasing other buckets versus those buckets? So I asked, I know I keep asking you two questions in one, but chair's prerogative, right? <laughs> so in terms of bronze utilization and kind of who selects that coverage, we did do a utilization analysis several years ago and it through that, we saw that bronze enrollees are on app. They have lower utilization, which you could say is maybe it's just because it's too expensive for them. But we also saw fewer um, emergency department visits. And there were some indications that they are, in fact, healthier. Um, and national analysis of who chooses bronze has demonstrated that as well. Mm -hmm. From a I don't have a racial or ethnic kind of demographic breakdown, but from the income level, because the silver plans are particularly attractive to people who are below 200% of the federal poverty level, and for that reason, in our plan display, we will show them first if you're in that category, we see that almost everybody who's in that FPL level does enroll in a silver plan. Okay. And overall, we see that about 70, 70 to 75% of our enrollment is in a silver plan that has um, at least a gold level of coverage because it's one of those variants or a gold plan. So about 70 to 75% of our enrollees are in a gold equivalent plan or better. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Can't see all the screens. No other questions? Okay, um, I want to make a motion to approve the, the proposed value plan certification standards for plan year 2025 as presented. Can I get a motion? Yes. I move. Yes. Dana? Yes. Yeah. Second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Michelle, do you want to do the same thing again just to make sure you have everyone? Happy to. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Aluk? Yes. Commissioner Brain? Yes. Ms. Crandon? Yes. Ms. P Pilar Rodriguez? Yes. Secretary Herrera Scott? Pilar Rodriguez. Uh, yes, Pilar Rodriguez. My, my mouth has problems with that. <laughs> I tried. Mr. Stefan? Yes. And, Ms. and that was a yes for me. Sorry, I yes. was just helping you with your pronunciation. 
I can't roll my R's. <laughs> and Miss Wetkester. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Any opposed? Motion moves. Motion approved. Thank you. So uh, next on the agenda is Johanna again to talk about the final plan certification standards. No, to talk about the estimated reinsurance parameters. Thank you, yes. Um, and I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. Um, next slide. So each year um, per the regulatory text, you can see here the board is tasked with setting estimated um, reinsurance program payment parameters for the following year by April. In practice, um, we ask the board to do that in February so that carriers have that information and time to incorporate in the rates they file with the MIA typically in May. Um, so we're here to complete that annual process again. Next slide. Um, and this, these are some key dates. I won't go through all of them. Uh, really the key one for the board is just to note that we'll come back in July after we've gathered additional data from the carriers on 2023 claims experience and analyzed that with final 2025 recommendations. So these are, are really estimates. We don't have our 2023 claims data yet to update our projections, but we'll be gathering that over the spring and we'll be back to the board with um, better informed recommendations in the summer. Next slide. So for the purposes of 2025 rate filings of setting these estimated parameters, um, and this I'll mention, we again develop in consultation with our consulting actuaries and with um, the MIA, we recommend an attachment point of $21,000, which is a $1,000 increase from 2024, and to maintain a coinsurance rate of 80% and a cap of $250,000, which have been um, the same for the history of the program. And we also, again, recommend that the board determine that a dampening factor to be provided by the commissioner is required. So the board um, doesn't have the authority to set the dampening factor, but they have the authority to determine if it's necessary, and then the insurance commissioner determines what that factor is. And just to rewind a moment um, to clarify what the dampening factor is, um, we have, uh, we obviously operate the reinsurance program. The federal government operates what's called a risk adjustment program. Both programs are targeted at mitigating the costs of high cost enrollees in the individual market. And the dampening factor adjusts reinsurance payments to carriers to account for potential overlap between these two programs to reduce the chance of carriers being overcompensated for high cost enrollees. Um, and then kind of rewinding again, just as a refresher, the attachment point is the uh, amount at which the reinsurance program starts covering costs for an individual. So if an individual has claims in a year that exceed the attachment point, then the reinsurance program kicks in. The reinsurance program covers the amount established by the coinsurance rate, so up to this point, 80% of costs, until the individual hits the cap on the program. So the program in 2024 is covering 80% of costs for an individual up to 200 and over $20,000 and up to $250,000. After that point, the carrier is again on the hook to cover those costs. Um, and actually, I'll just say, um, if we can go back to the back of slide, Cynthia, um, the last thing I'll say is that we, um, when we updated our projections last for the reinsurance program, which was last summer, at that point, kind of in conversation with MIA and our consulting actuaries, we decided to incorporate into those projections going out a consistent $1,000 increase in the attachment point annually, starting with 2025. It has basically been at $20,000 for the duration of the program with one dip in 2023. But of course, with inflation, medical trend claims costs, if you hold something flat, it actually becomes more valuable over time, um, which and the 
reinsurance program is targeted to cover approximately 30% of claims in the individual market. So if we don't eventually increase that attachment point, the amount of claims that we'll cover will grow and grow. So we chose the $1,000 increase as a way to both kind of keep up with medical trend and also protect the solvency of the program. Um, and looking at our um, project, our enrollment this year compared to projections from last year, Lewis and Ellis felt that it was reasonable to maintain that $1,000 um, for these estimated projections. Um, next slide. And the, the last slide um, really that I have here is one that has been shared with the board before. This shows the um, sort of financial projections for the program, just so you have a sense of um, what we are looking at going forward with these parameters. And as to orient you to the graph, the bars, the green and blue, indicate incoming funding on an annual basis. So the green is the federal pass-through funding that we have received or project we will receive each year. The blue is the 1% assessment fund on health insurance premiums that goes to the um, reinsurance program. So green plus blue together, um, federal plus state is the incoming funding each year. The red line is the cost of the program. So you can see that you know, grows over time. And the purple line is our reinsurance fund balance at the end of the year. Um, so just a couple of things to note here. You can see that that um, reinsurance fund balance dips in 20, kind of between 2021 and 2022, then gradually grows, then starts declining after 2025. Similarly, you can see that the red line, the cost of the program, has been less than the annual incoming funding most years and is projected to continue on that pattern through 2025. In 2026, we see the funding dip below the projected cost of the program. That's due to the anticipated end of the enhanced federal subsidies established under the um, American Rescue Plan Act. We are hopeful that Congress will act to continue those subsidies, but those subsidies increase our federal pass-through funding. So if they end, we'll see that fund federal funding dip. Um, but if they continue, we would see those um, funding lines continue to slightly exceed the cost of the program. So we'll, we'll see what happens, um, but certainly hoping they're continued. However, even if they're not continued and we do start having to dip into our reserve fund, we still anticipate ending this current waiver period we have with the federal government, which ends in 2028, with an over $300 million balance. So we're comfortable with the solvency of the program kind of in either scenario through 2028. Um, but of course, we'll keep an eye on that um, as, as we see how things progress with Congress. Um, last slide, I sort of already went over this when I was discussing timeline, so I'll skip over this. I'm um, happy to take any questions. Does anyone have questions besides me? I want to just open up the floor before I ask my questions again. Anybody? No? Okay, Johanna, so... And Michelle, you've heard this, but everybody hasn't heard me. It's, this is a really, really generous program, right? Um, for the carriers. And so and I see, you know, we up the, what is it? The, you know, attachment point. attachment point, right? By a thousand and you've been upping it. So, so are we staying as conservative as we are? Like, I, I just don't understand what the fund balance that we have why we wouldn't expect more from the carriers. I mean, given, yeah, given how generous the program is today, like just remind me of the rationale why we're, we're, we've built such a generous program. Sure, and if we can go back um, a slide, Cynthia. So the, a, a few reasons. Um, there seems to be a correlation between the generosity of the program and the ratio of federal funding you get. So as it gets okay. more generous, you're drawing down more federal funding. Okay. So that's one. Um, and we have also 
you know, certainly seen the impact on the market. Rates now are 20 percent below where they were at 20 in 2018 without any adjustments for inflation. They're at least 30 percent or more below what we we and carriers anticipate they would be absent. So by saying that, you're saying it's it, that it's more affordable. So more people are buying health insurance coverage than under prior. OK, Yes, we've seen our enrollment grow significantly since okay. um, the program was launched. So we have seen the benefit from it directly. And we've seen our unsubsidized enrollment for the folks who most directly benefit from this increase substantially since the program launched. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Other questions? Okay. I move to approve the S. Oh, can you go to the last slide? I want to make sure I'm in the right place. Okay, I move to approve the estimated parameters for the 2025 state reinsurance program as presented. Ben, go ahead. Oh, no question. I'm sorry, I just. Oh, okay. Yeah. With an attachment point of 21,000, a coinsurance rate of 80%, a cap of 250,000, and a dampening factor to be provided by the insurance commissioner. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you want to take your roll call to see if we're all in favor? Pardon my informality, but I'm going to go with first names. Ronnie. Here. <laughs> Aika. Yes. Kathleen. Yes. Uh, Laura Crandon. Aye. Maria. Yes. Laura Herrera Scott. Yes. Ben. Yes. And Dana. Thank you. Any questions Dana? from anyone? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank yes. you, Johanna. So next on the agenda is the marketing contract procurement. And we'll hear from, uh, I think it's Tracy and um, Maggie Church. Tracy Gamble and Maggie Church. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm Maggie Church. I'm the deputy director for the marketing team. Um, so the marketing contract includes uh, these services, the marketing and communication strategy support, advertising, creative services, media planning and buying, online marketing and digital design, social media, outreach and education, collateral development, and UX testing and web design support. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, and the panel met and we uh, recommend that the contract go to GMMB. They produced strong technical and financial proposals with a deep understanding of the Affordable Care Act. This agency has worked with state-based marketplaces since the inception of the Affordable Care Act. They fully met or exceeded all technical delivery and the financial and technical proposals demonstrated continue to be the best value for the state. There is a MBE requirement on this contract of 12%. GMMB proposed 12.32%, 5.09% for Cool and Associates who will do Hispanic outreach and partnerships, 3.78% to Sandy Hillman um, does earned media and uh, outreach and partnerships. 1.85% to Eureka Facts for market research and 1.6% for AMSA for video creation. Good afternoon, everyone. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the contract terms for the marketing contract for not to exceed amount of $4,060,000 for FY25 as allotted in our approved FY25 budget for a total cost of $20,000,000 $300,000 for five years. The breakdown is as follows. For state funds, $2,225,367. And for federal funds, $1,834,633. And the term is a three-year base period of July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2027, with two option periods one to commence July 1st, 2027 to June 30th, 2028. And then the second option period would be July 1st, 2028 through June 30th, 2029. 
Are there any questions? Are there any questions from anyone? Uh, yeah, um, I think GMMB is the incumbent. Am I correct? And I, I yes. didn't hear that. Yes, yes, yes sure. they are. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Ben? Uh, um, yes, uh, I don't know if Maggie or um, I, I think you're you're showing up under Tony's. Uh, sorry, uh, but is are they meeting the MBE commitments under the current contract? I don't think there is one right now. Sorry, Mag, I didn't mean to. Yes, yes, Maybe there is. yes, sorry. yes, there is. Yes, they are. Me. They are currently, and I'm gonna allow Tony to elaborate more on that. Yes, they are though. So yes, there, 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 there is a percentage. Um, it's uh, it's ten percent, and yes, they are meeting that ten percent, and they have met that ten percent for the past three years, and probably before that. But as long as I've been, um, doing doing the MBE liaison myself and Tishma, they they have been meeting it. Yes. And so it, so the, the went up this year. Yes, we we it went up the from ten percent to twelve percent this year. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Um, I move to approve a contract award for MHBE full service communications and marketing services to GMMB Inc. for a one year not to exceed base amount of $4,060,000 with the two one year optional renewals for a total not to exceed amount of 20 million 300,000 as presented. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. This Thank, you. Thank you. Michelle, do you want to? We have Dr. Allen and, and Mr. Stefan, Ben and Ronnie. Michelle, you, you want everyone to just raise their hand? Sure, we can do that. I can't see everyone. So can, can everyone raise everyone. their hands all in favor? Okay, we have all hands raised. Um, any questions from anyone? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next on the agenda is uh, Tracy Gamble again and Venkat to talk about um, Databricks subscription procurement. Thank you, Secretary. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. And today we are requesting uh, the board's approval to procure a software. Before going into the details of the software and the procurement details, I would like to give a very brief overview of what we are asking for and what's the status of our data. Um, as Andy talked about in his uh, strategy presentation, this aligns uh, with our strategy around data uh, in terms of strengthening through uh, organization through data and telling our stories through data and evaluating and securing tools uh, for data reporting. Um, in this slide, you see uh, approximate classification of MHP's data. Uh, the first uh, one on the left is the transactional and operational data. This is the data that the consumers enter and any other data that happens around transactions. Uh, most of them are structured, some of them are unstructured, meaning, for example, when a consumer type in uh, types in the chat bot, for example, asking for a help, that's kind of an unstructured data. And the second type of data that we have is a huge amount of data, that's our data logs. Uh, that is in behind the scene, what happens when consumer uh, enters data and then how transactions are processed. processed. So we have a variety of data uh, under that. And then as you know, the call center data, when a consumer calls, uh, the call center ticket is open. Uh, that data is stored in our Salesforce CRM system. And last but not the least, the emerging social channels and the data around that as well. So at this time, when uh, the exchange provides data to our stakeholders through various reports, actually 75 different reports in a month, and also, uh, as Andy noted earlier, uh, through our monthly data uh, reporting uh, to our stakeholder site, and also through our monthly dashboard, uh, we uh, the way we extract the data is uh, rapidly becoming obsolete. The technology is becoming obsolete. The way we do is 
to have a replica of our production transactional data in a separate location, and then various tools connect to the data and extract the data and a bit lot of technology support. Uh, we provide the reporting and dashboarding capabilities. Uh, as we evolve beyond that, uh, we don't want to be left out in legacy systems, obviously. So uh, we wanted to think in a different way. This is, uh, um, this is the way, the newer way of uh, collecting data, storing data, as well as processing data and analyzing the data. So next slide, please. So here you can see on the right side, it's a little uh, small, but hopefully you can see that. Um, what the new way of doing processing data is through uh, something called data lake house. Uh, as a simple um, explanation to that is assume that as a digital library of kind of a central hub connecting variety of data that data lives there uh, in a secured way and accessible in a secured way and can be in a very granular state. So a variety of tools can access them and valuable insights can be inferred from them. And this is a, a relative, not the, actually a newer concept has been in there for quite some time, uh, but we are moving towards um, having a data lake house for the exchange, basically separating the transactional data from reporting data. Uh, that will really enhance our performance on the transaction side, or rather not cripple our performance on the transaction side, but at the same time uh, would help us scale our operations uh, as well as cater to all sorts of data analysis and reporting needs uh, from the exchange. And again, as I said earlier, this would be our next step in our journey towards making more uh, data-driven decisions, uh, be it a dashboard, be it a data analytics platform for our policy team or stakeholders. Uh, the data would reside in a separate place in a secure way where we can control the data in terms of access and any other governance and compliance requirements as well. Next slide, please. So we looked into a variety of tools and uh, there are quite a few, Databricks is one example and Snowflake is another. There are a few other, we consulted with Gartner. Uh, we worked closely with Gartner for research and also we did proof of concept for top two um, products, Databricks is one of them. And uh, we find that uh, obviously this is one of the market leaders uh, in this area and facilitates variety of data governance for our needs. And the storage capacity is uh, scalable for our use, especially around data management and analytics. And also down the line when we um, uh, incorporate more and more AI capabilities, uh, we will have more customizable analytical and AI solution embedded into this platform as well. Uh, and also we definitely looked at the cost and uh, we don't want to go in a big bank implementation. So we are taking a very smaller chunk and uh, uh, we find that this particular software is cost effective for our use. As we expand, uh, depending on our need, uh, we can expand it uh, in a systemic way. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, I will stop uh, and I will request our procurement manager to uh, present the details on the procurement. Okay, so we actually utilized the competitive sale bid method and we issued an invitation for bid to actually acquire our actual bids for Databricks. The period of performance would be for one year, which would, if approved, would actually start March 1st. The annual cost is $206,700. We received a total of eight bids. Five of those bids were actually qualified for actual review. Three were deemed non-responsive and the selected vendor was Techbomo Limited Liability Company. Next slide. So the cost breakdown and the federal the federal uh, split would actually be $136,422, and the state would be 25% of that total, which is $70,278 for the total cost of $206,700. Next slide. Are there any questions? 
I have one. Why is it only for one year? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Vexer. Actually, this is a newer product and this is very rapidly evolving, especially in the AI uh, area. So we would like to uh, first in this, during this first year to see how effective this is and down the line, uh, we may have to add, add additional tools uh, uh, within the Databricks ecosystem. So we just wanted to take it uh, one step at a time. That's the reason. I know it's a little extra work on for us in terms of administratively, but uh, especially with any new software, uh, that's the kind of approach that we take at this time. And I have several questions. So Venkat, I, I thought you were saying it's a data lake but you're saying it's not a data lake because you is. reference AI. Uh, I'm sorry, Secretary, I did not understand your question. So I thought I thought what this product was was a data lake, but That's you reference AI a couple of times, right? That's not the same as a data lake. So I'm just trying to understand what this product is and what you're using it for. Sure, Secretary. Uh, if we can uh, go back a couple of slides, Cynthia. One couple of more, please. No, one more. One more. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm sorry for causing any confusion here. So one of the uh, future use cases for uh, this particular data lake house product uh, would be to uh, cater to variety of machine learning capabilities. But that we are not procuring any of those at this time. Um, so right now, this product would store data, host variety of data, like I showed, and can have host variety of connectors to this uh, data lake house. And then we have already, we have a couple of tools like Tableau and a few other tools that can extract data out of this uh, data lake house and present it uh, to the stakeholders. At the okay. same time- Okay, so you're just putting it all in one place one so point. you can have the front ends like Tableau, pull yeah. the data forward when you need it without having to ping each data system to pull it forward, correct? Yeah. Exactly, I think you- But it's not AI. I just wanna be clear. This is just a lake you're buying. That is correct. Okay, yes. thank you. Laura? Yes, it was my understanding that there was a data lake house in place already as part of a prior year's investment. Do I have that wrong or this was only on the plan? This is the first time we are implementing this, Ms. Um, Kanda. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none or seeing no additional hands, I move to approve a contract to award TechFOMO Limited Liability Company to procure a Databricks license subscription for the period from March 1st, 2024 to February 28th, 2025 in the amount of $206,700 with a federal participation amount of $136,400 and state participation amount of $70,278 as presented. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Ronnie. Second? Second. Is that Dana? Yes. Okay. Um, all in favor, we can raise our hands for Michelle. Michelle, do you have everyone that you need? I can't see Laura Crandon. She's got her hand, her little hand. Oh, up. her little hand raised. Got yes. it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any questions from anyone? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Thank Ben you. Kat. Thank you, sir. Um, next, we have uh, fulfillment of our not to exceed increase for uh, public health emergency. I'm assuming that's what it is, uh, unwinding, but, but, uh, is that it? Consumer Assistance Contract Review. Yes, yes, Doctor, um, Doctor Harris Scott. Yes, you, you are correct. Okay, it's all you. Okay, thank you. Um, the Fulfillment Services Contract is the first um, area that, that we needed increase for FY twenty four, um, and the Fulfillment Service Contract Services Contract covers um, print and mail consumer. It prints the printing and mailing of consumer tax. The consumer notices, I'm sorry, tax forms, voter registration forms, NCO enrollment packet, Medicaid cards, and they receive and process incoming mail. Um, so they do quite a bit for us. Um, uh, so 
um, on May 15th, I'm, I'm reviewing what happened in the past, um, 2023, the board approved the not to exceed amount for FY24 of $6,632,283, which includes um, estimated postage. Um, due to the public health emergency unwind, projected fulfillment costs will exceed the current NTE by roughly $2.25 million. Um, and I, I have a chart on the next screen, so I'm not just going to throw the numbers at you. I'm going to show you. Um, <clears throat> the funding split um, for um, fulfillment is 45.19%. Uh, uh, and uh, for the federal and the state is 54.81%. Um, and, and here's the chart, basically. Um, what, what I'm doing is I'm comparing uh, FY23 actual, which is the second column of numbers, and FY24 actual through June. Um, and then the projected is through um, from February to June. And as you can see from the total, um, the uh, the total actual plus estimated costs for the rest of the fiscal year is going to be eight point nine million dollars, um, of which we have six point six. <clears throat> so the NTE asked the difference is two point two four nine million, um, and that's what this um, ask is for. Now you can see the increase um, compared to FY twenty four and FY twenty three. Is is quite substantial. It's it's um fifty six percent, and it's um three point two million dollars more that we're spending in FY twenty four due to the uh, uh, PHE unwind. Okay. Are uh, right there before we get to the um motion? Are, are there any questions from anyone? Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Scott, questions? Oh, nope. sorry. I was just going to ask one last time. No questions from anyone? Okay. I move to approve an increase to the FY24 not to exceed amount for the art negative fulfillment contract by $2,249,100 for a new not to exceed amount of $8,881,333 as presented. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Ronnie. Second. Sure. Second. Sure. Dana, thank you. Uh, if we can all all in favor, please raise your hand. Got it, Michelle? I've got everyone. Thank you. Any questions? Any opposed? Dana, is your officially is your hand raised with a new question? Same with Laura. Is it raised for to say you're in favor? I'm in favor. Okay. okay. I am not. This is Laura. You are not. So you have a question. Go ahead, Laura. Oh no, no. It's um, so you, oh, you're not I'm in so favor. Sorry. Okay. That's correct. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, thank you. So so Michelle, you have um no questions, one opposed. Okay. Um, we still have a quorum for approval, correct? That is correct. Okay, so motion carries. Thank you. Um, I think, Tony, this is you on the Consolidated Service Center as well? Yes, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Um, as, as far as the Consolidated Service Center, um, you, thank you. Um, at the uh, May 2023 Board of Trustees meeting, the board approved FY20 not to exceed amount of 16.1 million. Um, <clears throat> due to the public health emergency unwind at the January 2024 board meeting, which was last month, the NT of the uh, Consolidated Service Center contract was increased by $3.9 million to cover additional uh, public health emergency unwind costs. Um, since the January board meeting, um, we were requested to remain open for additional Saturdays and uh, robocalls continue in the future. And I'll let I'll let um, uh, Tamara um, discuss. That. Hello, everyone. Um, MDH has required um, and requested that the call center 
uh, remain open on Saturdays um, through June. And they also ask that we continue on um, robocalls. So that is where the increase is coming from. On behalf of the PHE Unwinding, is there any questions? Mayor, just to clarify, the robocalls are through the end of April. Yes, I'm sorry. Robocalls are through the end of April. My apologies. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, could you go to the next page? Um, <clears throat> modification number nine uh, extends, and, and just basically this is a recap of what um, Tamara just said. Um, the total estimated costs are 193050 Um, And you might be questioning that the fact that that is below $200,000. Um, however, um, the board uh, uh, procurement policy state in the, in the area of contract modifications, that the board needs to approve contract modifications in excess of $100,000 um and uh and 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 lower than 20 percent so and so greater than 20 percent so basically uh this is naturally over a hundred thousand dollars so that's that's why we're coming to the board um so the federal fund split um is 74.28 percent and the state fund split is 25.72 percent um, and we don't feel that we're going to need additional not to exceed amount um, because uh, since last board meeting, we, we did receive some invoices um, or what was approved in January. And there's enough room in the NTE that was approved in uh, January that um, $193,000 will be covered. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? For this one, Michelle, do we need a motion on this one or a request? I'm, I'm not clear for this one what we need. We need a motion because of the procurement policy that says if, it, if a modification is over a hundred thousand, we need to have the board approve it. Okay. Um. Um. I move to uh, uh, approve um uh, the board's request um for modification number nine for the consolidated service service contract in the amount of one ninety three zero five zero. And for the record, this doesn't impact the not to exceed amount for the total contract. Um, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. That's... Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, all in favor, if you can raise your hand again. Hey, I've got everyone. Okay, any questions? Any opposed? So when you say you got everyone, you got everyone on the all in favor? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So I think that ends the formal agenda for today, correct, Michelle? That so, is correct. So I do want to um, say we will be officially closing the meeting, um, but I want to also add that the um, MHBE Board of Trustees will meet in closed session for the purpose of discussing pending procurement protests and appeals. This topic falls in the following closed meeting exceptions, consulting with counsel to obtain legal advice, consulting with counsel about pending or potential litigation, and discussing the context of a proposal be because public discussion would adversely impact the ability of the public body to participate in the competitive bidding or proposal pro process pursuant to general provisions, articles, subsection 3-305, B7, 8, and 14. In addition, the MHBE board will perform quasi-judicial and administrative functions during the closed meeting pursuant to general provisions article subsection 3-103. So I would like to officially close the meeting at 3.48 on uh, February 20th. And can I get a motion uh, to approve officially closing the meeting? So moved. Thank you. Second. 
Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Can we get a roll call on that just for our records, please? Absolutely. Brian? Aye. Aisha? Kathleen? Aye. Laura C? Aye. Maria? Yes. Laura Herrera Scott? Aye. Ben? Aye. And Dana? Aye. Great. So we will now move into closed session. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Does anybody, any of the board members need? The closed session link, I sent it all to you, but I just want to make sure because it's another number. Unless, unless could, Sharon, could you, whatever can you, you share it with me? Because I always have a problem yeah. with closed session. It's Laura H. Okay. Thank and, you. And Laura C. Please send so the Laura's have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia, if you can, can, you send send can you please send it to everyone again? I, uh, I will. I will. Okay. Thank you.